skin flaps into another direction creating the tension dynamics into another plane so and if you if you have 45 degree angle then 50% length gain and if you have 60 degree angle then 75% length gain so if there is a half circle half rectangle half triangle and this creates a more an irregular scar and i will show you how scar is imperceptible more irregular more imperceptible like in this case now when there is a contracture we have to do multiple z plasties and uh, these kind of patients are actually body dysmorphic disorder don't take them they will wake you up in the night reduce the depigmentary changes so that you, you can also give it at a very uh, i mean uh, you i mean the the cryo can be uh, applied for a very long time for example this is the case which i have showed you and we have uh, each uh, intralational cryotherapy uh, session lasted for almost 4 uh, minutes to 5 minutes when we do a superficial cryotherapy it will be in seconds actually 10 seconds to i mean on the sides it's through and through and uh, it is something like a dumbbell keylot so you need to completely remove the tissue and close it from both the sides you don't require any flap surgeries yet and it can be definitely without much of an issue you could uh, get it uh, done and similarly this is another you know, here we have closed it with a with a flap and this is how it has healed the same patient on the other side both the sides she had keloid this is another keloid it's here we have used an a surgical excision followed by closures and this is the post operative management silicon gel sheeting with a a pressure device we have used a paper clip there and this is one year after the surgery and this is another case here also the technique is different depending upon the type of the keloids this is how we have removed it and we have closed it without any pressure and this is how it is and the the last photograph is after one year which is very simple anybody could do it you don't require much of uh, i mean technology here so we have used a simple shave excision with effective hemostasis so this is before and this is after this is before and this is after about 3 months there is significant you can use all these things and uh, initially if you are using for acne scars you can have a two different levels so that is a simple subsession at the immediately under each scar and a subcuticular subsession at the abnormal texture thickness and stiffness of the burn scar non ablative for superficial scars pigmentary lasers if there is any post pigmentary pigmentation and laser assisted drug delivery these are various things which you could use with the energy based devices so this is a paper which is a recent paper which shows and which says that surgery is not the answer it is always the energy based device so patients of segment with leg or actually good candidates for this like surgery and the most important consideration for that is stability there are, there are advantages and disadvantages of both and it's always good to have situations where you use tissue and situations where you use cellular crafts the tissue grafts they include the mini punch suction blister split thickness curettage flip flop and hair follicle these are the classical ones then the, the current ones which you use is non cultured epidermal cell uh, but you cannot do it for large areas Uh, a very important thing which one needs to keep in mind is the size of the punch. I mean, if you keep it to less than a millimeter, the major complication uh, which you can get with mini punch is the cobble storing can be reduced. Need to um, drain the fluid, need to the blister and transplant it to the required site. That's a very simple procedure performed by Yon Gothia, and uh, Yon Gothia is a very famous pioneer in this type of surgery. So. the basic premise he made was and he had a very impressive thing he raised suction blisters and injected trypsin in them and uh, when he injected trypsin uh, so what happens is trypsin cleaves it then it separates the epidermis from the dermis so and then he should take it and apply it. but it was very very localized so what he started out was with suction blisters and apply trypsin and then it was taken by you know to separate uh, to separate them the what is it takes time so you need multiple incubations with trypsin so and then after multiple incubations with trypsin. speaking to you on electrocautery or electrosurgery and cryotherapy so first coming to electrosurgery 
So, what is the difference? What is electrocautery? What is electrosurgery? So, electrosurgery is a procedure where the patient only uh, patient is the part of the circuit, and the electric current passes through the tissue. Whereas in electrocautery, patient won't be part of the circuit, and electric current will be just at the superficial level. So, again, one more term: radio frequency. So, what is radio frequency? Radio frequency uh, instrument works on the principle at uh, frequency of 3.8 megahertz whereas other uh, electrocautery machines or electrosurgery machines that will work at a general uh, um, uh, frequency so whenever you are buying if radio frequency you can opt for then it is better because it is very precise and very specific so what exactly happens in radio frequency for then it works on the principle of increase in frequency and voltage while simultaneously decreasing the amperage of alternating current so as to generate the radio waves. So in a radio frequency equipment, it is radio waves which are acting rather than electric current. So what exactly happens at the tissue level? Whenever you use an electrocautery machine or uh, electrosurgery instrument, so there is resistance to the passage of uh, the radio waves through which the, there is heat generation and this increase in temperature causes intracellular vaporization which leads to the cutting effect uh, in the tissue. So uh, no conflict of interest. Uh, so here I am showing an electrosurgical unit. This is a cautery machine. So here uh, we can see this uh, works on the principle of it will uh, work only at the superficial tissue level. So then this is a radio frequency equipment. So the difference between these two, I'll just show you a photograph. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, see the inside part of this. This is a radio frequency equipment. The central part and the third thing what you see, that is the um, uh, 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 part of the machine which increases the frequency and leads to the generation of radio waves. This is not available in India. So whichever company, Elman or anyone who is giving you this, they have to import it from Korea, South Korea or something. So little basics about the radio frequency, there is something called as monopolar polar circuit and the bipolar circuit. So what is monopolar circuit? In monopolar circuit, here we can see the active electrode and there is a ground plate. So your whole patient forms the circuit, whereas coming to the bipolar circuit, both of it acts at the level of the tissue. There is no, it doesn't pass through the uh, body. So what are the effect, the tissue effect which is seen uh, um, uh, when we use the uh, electrosurgery instrument? We have to work between uh, 60 degree to 100 degree. So what happens if you keep the uh, probe for a longer time, if more than 200 degree Celsius is uh, done, then there will be black coagulation or carbonization which can lead to the side effects of the types of waveforms. Whenever you, whenever you want coagulation, then damping of the waves has far away. So it will be kept away from the lesion. You are not touching the lesion in electrofoligration. Next comes the electrodesiccation. So electrodesiccation D for desiccation, D for dehydration or drying. So whenever we touch the instrument, it works on the principle of drying. So in uh, if postgraduates, if you are asked what is electrodesiccation, you can just tell this. D, uh, desiccation, D for drying, something like that. Coagulation, again, electrocoagulation to clot. And this is the one which causes maximum damage to the tissue. So whenever we are coagulating the uh, lesion, you have to be very careful about the spread of the lesion. So next coming, electrosection. What is electrosection? Section means to cut. So we can remember like that. It is there in the word itself. So electrosection, we use it for pure coat cutting mode. And uh, electroepilation. So what happens here, we might think, uh, uh, whenever we put the, we have a specific uh, probe which comes, uh, epilation probe. Whenever you put inside the hair follicle and whenever you uh, pass the uh, energy, there is chemical ionization which leads to the electrolysis. So this is electroepilation. So there are various uh, electrodes. Uh, see, what and leave. That is sufficient for it, for it to go away. Uh, if you want, just clean the uh, probe with the gauze. Don't go to go gauze derma bread, which is not required. Huh? And uh, yeah, for uh, um, in the further video, we can see. one minute. Can we forward this? Is there is an option to forward? Press intermittently and do it in a
paint layer, paint brush kind of fashion. Here, because the DPNs are uh, partially like skin tags, it's little larger. I'm touching it multiple times. So I will show you one result. And this patient had come. Uh, uh, she had a daughter's uh, wedding uh, in uh, one and a half month. She had come in June. Uh, so I've shown you the result in one month. Uh. So this is the result where I've removed uh, it in uh, three sessions. If you invest in your radio frequency, you can use it like a laser. That's what I would say. So yeah, one more uh, lesion here. Uh, this. Uh, um, patient had come with, uh, come to me with this lesion on the eyes. He had it since around uh, uh, 20 years. So his wife got uh, him and uh, she was very adamant on getting it removed. He was not interested though it is so big. It was affecting his vision as well. So in this I have uh, just cut the area because and then I have coagulated. It has healed very well. Uh, if I am able to show the next part of the video immediately yeah this is the flat probe which you can get which you can use to shave the uh, lesion for shaving this is very helpful and uh, once after shaving uh, the lesion if there is any bleeding spots you can change the probe to ball probe ball probes works very well one uh, just a touch with the ball probe the bleeding will stop okay but then the chances of uh, side effects with ball probe is the highest compared to any other what i have done after doing it with the ball probe the sides it was not cosmetically pleasing so i have taken a pointed probe again and done the sides so that it will look flat and the lesion has healed without a mark in this patient also Again, uh, difficult area to do. So here, uh, inside the nose, uh, here just we have cut the lesion. Done. The major part is done. Just coagulated. Done. Here we can uh, use the, we have uh, used a lignocaine spray. And again, uh, just I'm going to go faster here. Uh, so here we have used a probe, a flat probe to remove the lesion, and also used a ball probe. A uh, few more indications which I would like to uh, show. Here uh, I have done it for papilla scars. In this I have used an epilation needle and I have gone inside the lesion and used it. Beautiful results, less amount of scars. Definitely CO2 laser or ABM AG is uh, good. But then this also sh uh, sh uh, shows great result. Similarly for uh, in the um, uh, cannula, uh, 23 gauge cannula and we have made a window and then in the same window we have, uh, we will be using the radio frequency probe there and uh, we will be entering the lesion, keloid and uh, one minute. We have uh, used the, uh, at the window level we have uh, used the probe with slow motion of from the left hand you will remove the cannula and fast motion in the right hand you will be using in that area. So, so cryotherapy Liquid nitrogen, uh, we use at minus 20 degree for swab and minus 196 for spray or probe. And uh, differential sensitivity is very important. That's the reason depigmentation can happen. Melanocytes have minus 4 to minus 8. Indication, I'm going to skip. Contraindication, anything cold, you have to contraindicate. Collagen vascular disease, please be careful, ask the history. And uh, techniques, uh, I'm just going to show one or two methods. That's just the methods. I'll be quick enough to finish it. So here, uh, basically, we are supposed to apply the violet surrounding the tissue, uh, surrounding the lesion. Very important whenever you are doing a periangual ward. And uh, spray, keep it at one centimeter. Form a ice ball. That is the end point of uh, cryotherapy. And this is the result after uh, three sessions of cryo in three months without any depigmentation or any scarring. This is one uh, method which is uh, uh, which you can use like a confined cone. You can use a punch and you can uh, do it for the keloid, the uh, acne scar keloids. And the last uh, slide is on intralesional cryo. Uh, last uh, thing which I would like to say, 
Yes, whenever you are doing intralesional cryo, you have to be outside the the, uh, in, uh, the needle has to come outside. When I, whenever you are doing intralesional RF, the needle, the cannula should be inside only. Because if you don't come outside in intralesional cryo, I have heard from my colleagues there has pneumothorax also which has happened. So please be careful whenever you are doing intralesional cryo. So two two passes you can give of uh, around uh, uh, till you see the ice ball formation. Complication only thing which we have to worry is depigmentation. So be careful, apply bile in adequately and do. Thank you, thank you for this session. Dr. Kaleshwaran sir and Dr. Avitas John sir. Take informed consent um, for the procedure, uh, then we have to plan. Here you can see all kinds of uh, scars, uh, right from rolled out uh, ice pick and then box scars. For the ice pick scars, uh, I would like to do punch excision and uh, closure, and for which are uh, four millimeters diameter. And uh, for rolled out substitution, definitely will help. And some of the box scars also we can do either punch excision and uh, in line with the adjacent skin, it is just punch excision and elevation will do. Dr. Mathura, do you want to add to that? Yeah. And I'll tell you that this patient doesn't have much time. Okay, he has come for a short vacation. She wanted something to be done now. He is going to come back after six months for another one or two sessions. What would you do in this case? See, when we see like the most of the scars are like the box scars, and then like if the patient tells that he doesn't have much of time, then maybe a multimodal treatment would be better. Like uh, when we are doing the uh, examination, we also do the uh, smile test or the stretch test to see like how much the, uh, the scars are tethered. So when we do the bi-level subsession along with uh, the CO2 and shouldering of the box scars and uh, as Dr. Sandeep also mentioned to put the regenerative therapy, so maybe that will give a good results for the patient. So, so it's most, uh, mostly a multimodal approach, but so far, yes. But uh, one thing we need to know is that uh, this is in an inflammatory phase still. Yes. You can see uh, nodules, you can see erythema. This is the one where I say a fraction of carbon dioxide. A lot of people, 20 years back, they would have said, wait, let the acne subside, then we'll tackle the scars. By which time the patient is 50, no point. So, you know, I would, after, after they have done the basic procedures of looking at the punch grafts and the, the punch excisions and the elevations. I think you need to carpet bomb this with a fraction of CO2 and I would use a moderate to high power in this patient the tissue also, apart from ablating. So, this patient... Follow it up with uh, a fraction of CO2 with... I would definitely add on a region would again in SV. Just let us know that. Yeah, so I, I think... Uh, if I remember correctly, W plus T was done uh, because this is a depressed scar with prominent suture markings and hypopigmentation. And these, uh, although the nasolabial fold is a very good site for a scar, a scar revision or a scar excisional surgery, slightly away from nasolabial fold is always a problem. So we have to be careful and uh, almost always we follow with the uh, fractional CO2 subsequent to the scar revision. So I think this this is a good result and thank you for bringing this case. I don't even recall it. Exactly. A beautiful, uh, you know, crossing uh, skin tension line, not horizontally but obliquely. So uh, here we uh, excise the area, did a lot of undermining and put push sutures which we, we de uh, devised a new kind of sutures because here because we are against the skin tension line so we have to be uh, very good at uh, transferring tension in the deeper layers and uh, almost half of the forehead uh, on the upper side was undermined and the wound was closed without tension but still you can see that there was a depressed scar so this is because of the uh, stretching caused by skin tension lines. Yeah. Uh, anything more to be done? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Somesh. Yes, sir. 
when you run your finger over the scar and you find that some of it is tender or some is thicker some is do you alter your uh, surgical technique or do you wait for that uh, inflammation to subside i mean you see some of these are sclerotic feeling thick feeling uh, feel indurated others are pretty free so do you have changed a lot in in good hands you need not to wait for inflammation signs to be subsided and if we do a clean cut and good closure even those cases can be dealt with surgery so that the distance is occurred i think which dr shome showed is when the deeper layer is not closed well yes so i think we could have prevented a lot the initial surgeon or maybe it was too traumatic to actually get up so not follow this is such an important and this this outcome of this Carousel. Along with the surgery, also might be the botulinum toxin uh, injection. Can yes, be I'll come to that. Actually, basically, one of your cases I have. We'll discuss it then. The scars is done by us. And also, like the ones which are causing the functional deformity, like uh, a big, bigger ectropion. So, such cases also we do refer to the plastic surgeon. Ganesh, please, sir. There is a hypertrophic scar over there. It's an accident scar. this is the ideal candidate for a fractional co2 uh, i would use a higher density in this patient i would also use a higher power because this is at least 3 mm thick maybe even more yes. yeah. because we cannot half do this with lesser power we okay. have to get to the base of this and after that wait for it to heal before we do the next modality these respond very well Yes. anything on the face responds much better than anywhere else the face is full of sebaceous glands full of vascular tissue along with the carbon dioxide laser but like the same parameters what sir has already mentioned and uh, this two sessions we could almost flatten it up yeah so like these are the keloids which are there on the face this is actually we did a biopsy and it turned out to be a granuloma facie yeah and but definitely it has to be removed so she came so thinking that it's a keloid and so many people have treated it as a keloid as well this is how we got this patient it was referred and came so what would you do and how are you planning to treat her yes we have to treat the cause for granulation yeah there uh, just below the temple can yes. be excised and then it can be linearly closed mm. so maybe uh, the nasolabial lesion can also be closed primarily so might be i would take the first lesion in the nasolabial and the temple lesion can be done together yeah. and then the third lesion can be done after 3 months great great excellent this is what we want it has to be more practical and uh, dr sandeep do you have something i last question from mr sir last because i wanted to get from him actually yeah it's an option but i won't give it first okay so uh, it 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 will involve a, a, a well planned surgery and a good result at the end. Okay. So i would probably go with an interlesion first and then follow it up with maybe fractions would depending on how active the condition is so mr sir what would be your approach to so it? so the one which is close to the hairline is the easiest one to excise yes. because that area has a lot of yeah. uh, you know uh, expandability and the scar can be concealed easily yeah. and along the skin tension line mm -hmm. the worst kind of lesion which is uh, in the middle of the cheek mm -hmm. there i can i would prefer first to try intralesional injections and if it settles down then laser yes. and the one scar which is already uh, half like depressed and half elevated we can do staged excision a uh, small area to be removed in one session and the remaining in the other session to reduce the length of the scar see what we have done here is like we removed two different lesions one through a rhomboid flap the la the one towards the nose part the middle one as a uh, like a staged uh, excision and uh, recently the patient came for the third lesion and this is after the one again with another rhomboid flap and this is how she looks now so the earliest scars were not that bad this is immediately just two weeks 
after, I mean, one week after suture removal it is. So definitely it's always when you have multiple lesions, if you're not confident about doing everything together, if you don't, you can definitely do it at small, small sessions. And depending upon whatever technology, technique, if you are more comfortable with, I'm more comfortable with the rhombic flap. This is how you. So why we have chosen the W plasty here is uh, taking the advantage of the laxity lower, so that we can excise the extra amount of skin to give a good result. And then when we have undermined the flap side, we have also removed the art underneath, so that the pin cushion deformity gets corrected. And so this is how it is healed. So it's more of a W plasty which you have. Yes. We need to move with subsession first. There will be tethered areas, there will be tissues which are bound out. So we can do that. And While stretching it was almost improving. This is stretch, yeah, this, uh, I think if you stretch it, it, it looks uh, probably most of the scars will disappear. This is a great candidate for fractional CO2 for reasons uh, uh, apart from their being shallow. Uh, the patient is also fair skin. The patient is also young, so there's no sagging of the tissue. So this would do well with fractional CO2 and PRP, of course. Anybody else want to add anything to the management? Or so, like uh, when we tell about the subsession here, like I was telling about the stretch and then the smile test also, like here we feel that okay, the stretch test might be positive and the box cars are appearing to be a little superficial box cars. So, when we are doing the subsession, the needle succession which was shown uh, by to do the plenary session of uh, this hexicon. So uh, this plenary session is for Dr. P. N. Behel oration and uh, uh, this year's awardee is Dr. Maya Vedmurti ma'am. It is our pleasure and honor to confer her the award. Um, for this session our chairpersons are Dr. T. Salim sir, uh, our president of uh, XC. So uh, I call upon Dr. Salim sir to be here. Salim sir, is, sir kindly come on stage. I also call upon Dr. Dinesh Devaras, uh, organizing chair for Exicon 2024. And uh, I also call upon our academy co-chair Dr. D.S. Chandrasekhar uh, to chair the session. Sir is at Bangalore. Uh, director, medical director of Tutis Academy and uh, has huge interest in uh, academics. He is our uh, academy chair. Sir, kindly come on stage. I uh, am delighted to introduce reduced down on surgery and started it in India. He is the, uh, the pioneer in Vitigo surgery demonstration. He served as the past professor and head of the department, department of dermatology, Maulana Azhar Medical College, New Delhi. And uh, he was the first dermatologist in India to establish a skin institute uh, in private named the Skin Institute and School of Dermatology. Uh, he is known as a teacher par excellence and also a teacher of teachers. He has taught many students who are now in prominent positions in Indian dermatology and he has been the international face of Indian dermatology along with for nearly three decades. And in honor of him, Axi has introduced this and this has been a long-standing oration uh, to honor the legend in Indian dermatosurgical field and also dermatology. For the introduction, good morning respected chairpersons to deliver Dr. P. N. Bell's oration. So while preparing for this talk, which I had to put together in this talk, so some of them may look like fossils, kindly excuse me for it. The old dictum describes dermatology in the past as an ounce of Latin and a pound of Greece, highlighting the traditional focus on topical treatments and terminologies. It also says that the plastic surgeon redefines surgical techniques, physician redefines newer indication of old drugs, and dermatologists redefines nomenclature, but now dermatosurgery defies this statement. In fact, dermatosurgery has refined dermatology and today dermatology is much about precision, innovation and surgical skill. Now coming to my journey, I started my medical journey at the prestigious Madras Medical College 
It sparked my interest in procedures and rekindled my surgical desire. And I'm happy to share that my involvement in dermatosurgery surgery has not only brought me personal fulfillment, but also has been professionally recognized today. Thank you, Axie. Most of you would know Professor Thambaya, who is a legend in dermatology, and his disciple, Professor Patrick Yasudian. I had the privilege of being taught hardcore clinics. Professor Kamalam, who taught me mycology, Professor Sindhamal Selvi, and Professor Janaki, who have extended their support beyond professional life, positively influencing my personal life as well. I would also like to remember Dr. She Rekha Shed, who even in my early days encouraged me to deliver talks and asked me to conduct workshops at every CDSI meet. And I was also made the Vice President of Cosmetic Dermatology Society of India, 2006 to 2008. And it is during this period that we decided to change the name of CSI Cosmetology Society of India to Cosmetic Dermatology Society of India for obvious reasons. Now, how did I transition to dermatosurgery? surgery? I had joined government service to the corporate hospital made me witness the increasing demand for aesthetic procedures and increased awareness among patients on advances in dermatology. My patients would tell me that they were going to Singapore, which was the closest place, and they would say they were going to Bangkok, and seized the opportunity to attend the skin therapy update in 1995, and then I attended a one-week observership at the National Skin Center Singapore, because Professor Patrick had given me a letter of recommendation to Professor Goh, and he allowed me to be an observer to start with, and return home with a bunch of new straight up peels, and there's no looking back. Now, encouraged by the patient's acceptance for procedures, I pursued an observership course in dermatosurgery surgery and hair transplant as it is a dream of every young dermatologist even today. I did this at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in 1999. And this is a group of the hair transplant team where I did my observation. That is Robert Haber, who was an amazing award-winning hair restoration surgeon and these were the three hair transplant nurses and that was the counselor. This formed the team. And this is one of the nurse who was slivering the grafts and placing it on a tray. And they were so beautiful and they used it just with persona blade and, and the blade holder and on a very good microscope. I thought it was such an easy job to do. So I decided to replicate it here. And at Cleveland Clinic, I also found a lot of lasers, sclerotherapy, more surgery and injectables, which I had never seen in my life. And I managed to return with basic equipments like Conmed Hyflicator, micropigmentation device, dermabrader and some hair transplant instruments, which are working even now. And this is Dr. Wilma Bergfeld, if you are able to recognize. I attended her hair clinic and I picked up a lot of important clues on treating hair disorders. And this is my first dermatosurgery book. In those days, we did not have dermatosurgery books and we were not as lucky as the youngsters now. As Sir William Osler said, to study the phenomena of disease without books is to sail an uncharted sea, while to study books without patients is not to go to sea at all. And I decided to do both. And this book by Ronick and Ronick on principles and practice of observership, I was inspired, as I mentioned earlier. I thought hair transplant is so simple. I decided to expand my practice by incorporating hair transplants. Even though I had limited training, it was not hands-on training, it was just a visual training. And there were no resources. None of my no nurses knew how to deliver the grafts. Despite my enthusiasm, the initial results of these hair transplant were not as successful I thought it to be and therefore I decided to focus my effort, efforts on procedures where I could really unsuccessful hair transplant and those days we did not have finasteride or deuteristride, just topical minoxidil and these hair transplants I would do after 9 p.m. because I would finish my clinical OP because I had to pay rent for my hours of time in the corporate hospital and sometimes it would even go up to midnight because the nurses were not trained 
that's a time but the general OT would be free and I could take the time as much as I needed. So with all this, I managed to do about 10 cases, then I decided it like a surgery, which I found to be a soul satisfying job. And I happened to attend the live dermatosurgery surgery workshop at Bala by Nanavati Hospital by none other than Dr. Satish Savant. And I started doing vitiligo surgery under the guidance of a plastic surgeon in my hospital. I did split skin grafts, punch grafts, and I even presented a paper on suction syringe technique for epidermal grafting at the 20th National Conference of IAD Well 2000 in Bangalore, 24 years ago. And these were the simple things that we used. I used the MR syringe, a glass syringe, and the simple rubber tubing. And this is all that I needed. Of course, now we have hijama cups. And sorry for the quality of the picture. I had to take it from my slide. And uh, this is how we would place the syringes. And this is the graft that we would get. And this is one of the grafts which I used on this patient's lip vitiligo. And these were my vitiligo surgery equipments. It was a Humpy's knife, Watson's modification. This was a derma braider kit that I had brought from there. And this was what was giving me the pleasure. And these are some of my cases, the case of mucosal vitiligo immediately post-op. And this was a one year later. And these are some of my vitiligo cases where I did split skin graft. And this is a lady who was from Kerala. I'm sure Dr. Salim would have still been in college at that time. Otherwise, I would not have case, got cases from Kerala. And this was the results two years later. She used to come once a year for follow-up. And this was another young man who had segmental vitiligo. And that was the result after two sessions. And this is a young girl with uh, vitiligo of the areola. And this is how I did the punch graft. And this is the result. Now, how did I transition to aesthetic practice? As I mentioned earlier, these cases used to be done either after 9 till midnight or had to be done during lunchtime because I would, did not want to miss out on my clinical dermatology. And during those days, the procedures were entirely dif different. They were very time consuming. And being a one-man army treating both clinical and surgical cases, it was very difficult for me. So I had, by then, injectables and energy-based devices had come in. So I decided to transition to injectables and energy-based devices because I could do them in my OPD and it was less time consuming and more remunerative. Mahatma Gandhi said, live as if you were to die, it's learning to stay updated. Learning is perpetual. Learning is a lifelong journey. I attended another chemical peel workshop at Princeton, New Jersey, where I learned a lot about Neostrata peels. Then when injectables caught up, I decided to attend a cosmetic dermatology advanced course in London from a plastic surgeon in Harley Street. And mesotherapy, if you remember in those days, was a big no-no. In UK and USA, they said they would never ever do mesotherapy, but now it's all over the place. The other day, Dr. Jerry Shapiro said that he's very happy doing deuterostrate mesotherapy because he was getting great results. So in those days, it was available only in the UAE and in Thailand. So I decided to go to UAE for training, clinical and theoretical um, training in mesotherapy. And recently, as all of you know, exosomes has been the buzzword. So I went to the Clear Skin Institute of Laser Aesthetics in Phoenix, Arizona in March 2022 and got trained in exosomes and microneedling radio frequency. I know there's lots more for me to learn. And in 2013, I attended a workshop in Italy under Dr. Riccardo Forte, and I was stunned by this PRP kit as well as the delivery system, which I'm yet to see one in India. Now, my interest in, and involvement in dermatosurgery opened up professional opportunities as a speaker and chair in international conferences. I had the opportunity to chair a session at the 24th World Congress of Dermatology in Milan and also recently in Singapore where I had to speak on new insights into mesotherapy. It was my dream to speak at the American Academy of Dermatology and there I had an opportunity to see tranexamic acid in the treatment of melasma, one on treatment of xanthelasma with 100% DCA and one on treatment of vitiligo by needling with topical 5-fluorouracil. 
Now, being a one-man army and just um, alone um, prize, and I was fortunate to get them published. I would thank Dr. Ashik for introducing me for into publications. We all know that many interdigital dermatoses such as candidiasis and intertrigo worsen when the area is moist and the response to therapy is much better and the recovery time is shorter if the affected toe spaces are kept separated at least while at rest and when asleep. So initially I got them made out of three years ago 200 to 300 rupees but as the price of silver went up I turned to men and physicians when they are treating conditions in the interdigital spaces like cryotherapy or electrocautery and even for nail surgery. Now Derma, I have entrusted this work Derma India and Derma India today has gifted me with 40 toe separators of three different sizes and I wish to distribute them to colleagues and friends today, those who are interested in having them. So those interested kindly contact me after this talk. Now, keeping hairs away during procedures can be cumbersome, especially in uh, non-cooperative patients and children. But using an ultrasound or an ECG gel can actually uh, make the hair stiffer and adhere to one another. And this technique can be used to keep the hair away from the field. And therefore, the need of a hairband or an assistant can be bypassed. Now, here in nose piercings, have always been popular and will continue to remain as beauty trends or cultural practices. For this, we only have a ear piercing gun or we have to two, use two needles, which is a little cumbersome. Here, we take a simple sterile hypodermic needle to fit the thickness of the earring or nose ring post. The needle hub is removed and we fit the earring or the nose ring post into the cut end of the needle and we just give a single pierce. The cost is low and the uh, procedure is sterile. Now, uh, we know that uh, idiopathic um, guttate hypomalnosis is a... It is said that pesky warts do more harm to spoil the reputation of the dermatologist than any other condition and so true. And most of the treatments for warts are partially successful and can have an increased rate of recurrence. And using an ultrasound gel, can prolong the freeze time and maintain the temperature for a longer period of time, making it more effective. And this paper of mine was flashed twice at the AAD and under practice pearl sessions by Stephen Stone. So I, I felt really proud to see my paper being flashed at the American Academy. Now I must sincerely thank Dr. Jayshree for inviting me to be the co-editor of this book on aesthetic dermatology. And this is uh, Professor CRS blessing us on the day of book release. Dr. Ganesh Pai and Dr. Srinivas have always been a source of constant inspiration. I cannot <coughs> forget the session on coffee with Maya at Dermacon suggested by Professor CRS. And I would like to take a moment to express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor CRS and Professor Ganesh Pai for their encouragement and support throughout my career. Thank you, sir. And my contribution. Wanting to give back to the community and share the knowledge, I joined a group of lovely friends, Dr. Malvika, Dr. Nina, and Dr. Mutta, and started training workshops and named it Indian Academy of Aesthetic Dermatology. We were way ahead of times. We ran the course successfully for a few years and unfortunately and I had the opportunity to host two such workshops in Chennai and you can see prominent figures there. You can see Dr. Vidya, you can see Dr. Um, Meera James whom we are missing today and uh, Dr. Tarun Mithil, Dr. Arthi. and then in 2009 you can see Dr. Kali Suren and you can see uh, Dr. Krishnakant who are all professors now. Now, I was determined to continue my efforts in educating the younger generation. I started a postdoctoral fellowship in aesthetic dermatology in my center. And this is attached to MJAD Medical University. And this is a one year course for post MD and DNB dermatology candidates only. As this provides an opportunity to learn dermatosurgery while pursuing their postgraduate dermatology course. Now, challenges. 
actually there was much less acceptance when I really started off. When I first ventured into dermatosurgery, surgery, it felt like stepping into a forbidden territory. I was looked up as an alien in this field and there was less acceptance from patients as well as colleagues. And I was actually practicing in just a single room but I had to move on to a bigger space and buy more devices. Now adversity in dermatosurgery surgery often comes in the form of unrealistic patient expectations as well as unexpected outcomes which is the norm. And the power of social media, it actually creates unhealthy competition amongst ourselves. And with Google misleading patients with its false five-star ratings for dermatologists. And to add to it, we have illegitimate competitors like the beauticians, the dentists, and the plastic surgeons. And thanks to IDAC who has come to our rescue. And I hope all of us will join hands with them to fight quackery. So in such situations while facing challenges and skepticism, I was always reminded of the golden words of Professor Tambaya, the glory of tomorrow is rooted in the drudgery of today. So the best practice is to have a both cosmetic dermatology as well as surgical derm medical dermatology practice because medical and surgical dermatology should thrive in the symbiotic relationship. As Walter B. Shelley said, knowing the diagnosis is good, knowing the cause is better, and knowing the cure is best. And most often we know that dermatosurgery has the answer. Now what is the future of dermatology for the youngsters? The future for solution for disease or desired dermatology is comprehensive skin care. Trends and innovations will continue to appear by leaps and bounds. AI will be the future. This is one of my patients who had brought her face with her AI app and she told me that she was on the forehead and fillers in other areas as shown in the thing because she had the before and after of how she would look in that AI app. So this is what it's going to be in the future. So I think all of us have to be geared up to face these patients. And days are not far off before when MCH goes in dermatology will happen. So stay updated. My humble suggestions, post-graduation courses should include dermatosurgery training in their medical curriculum so that they do not turn to bodies like the Illamed for qualification. And they should be taught not to call themselves cosmetologists, to surgeons, interventional cardiologists or procedural dermatologists. And hardcore clinical dermatologists, please refer cases to the needy patients to the respective dermatosurgeons, otherwise they are going to quacks and beauticians and we need to help our dermatosurgeons. And ethical practice always. Let not dermatosurgery be a hammer for which everything is a nail. And we need to have a mindset to shift from disease or medical dermatology to desire or surgical dermatology. We need to adapt to the times. And if you see, there's a book on surgery of the skin on procedural dermatology decades ago. And still, we are not, most of them are not able to embrace or encourage our postgraduate students. And this dermatosurgery is a catalyst change that has occurred in dermatology. And as Charles Darwin says, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is adaptable to change. So let's all change for the better. A big thank you all for listening. I dedicate this oration to all my teachers, family, staff, and above all my patients, without whom this would have
he used to say like Sri Krishna, I won't uh, hold any Shastra in my hand, but I will tell you few tricks and tips. And two more life jackets or you can call it lifelines in KBC, way back in 2500 to 3000 BC. Original work of exchange of skin grafts in vitiligo was done by Spencer and Tolmack in 1952. Studies with punch grafts 1986 by Bacon and Schmidt. What is the aim of surgical treatment? To replace the melanocytes that are missing in the acrobic epidermis by the melanocytes obtained from donor sites. Surgery is accomplished to achieve cosmetically acceptable repigmentation. Cosmetically acceptable is very important. What are the indications? He said to me. But then Narpuri uh, said we will develop uh, uh, manual punch for tackling. This more epidermal that is split thickness skin graft or follicular hair grafts now we are using or non-cultured epidermal cell suspension. Tissue grafts, split thickness skin graft was the first to be used and at that time we used to refer to plastic surgeon. So it is fair solier 0.125 to 0.75 millimeter thick and uh, but the disposable head was pretty expensive. And the recipient area is dermabrid and again you can see the stuck on appearance and if you are hasty in taking decisions in uh, WCD Paris. Then came suction blister and Dharpur said made me to induce blister on myself. So tops of blisters harvested it to the suction pump and in, I sat for 2 to 3 hours and blisters were formed side up and sprayed nicely. You can see here it is the head of the forceps. Uh, nozzle used by the ENT people to restrict the spread. No need of dermabrasion, only epidermis is removed, no bleeding. It is important to restrict because nitrogen is known to cause depigmentation. You must have seen the in keloids. So it is better to restore ear lobe repair and this was also published in the textbook. So this is epidermal grafting, a little bit. Okay. Okay. These are lifetime awards by the patients. So advantage is simple, safe, inexpensive and effective treatment of lesions is good. And if case selection is proper, you get this Kevnar depigmentation. So I touched his feet. Another person is Matt Solson from Sweden, Uppsala University. He had come to deliver a talk in Pune University, National Center for Cell Sciences, uh, which was attended by Garpuri sir and me. The recipient area. This is a case of hypertrophic lichen planus, which is given intraluminous steroid, and also q switch toning to reduce the pigment. Among peels, glycolic acid rules with respect to pH and pigmentation. This is the insect bite reaction with pH with glycolic acid peels. Again, when it comes to acne pigmentation, glycolic acid rules again, probably you will have a lot of combination peels which you can use. This is my set point. This is a case of Megas nevus. We removed the hair. With enthusiasm, I put my NDR laser, Pico laser, See the amount of pH developed after picozoom. One session of picozoom has developed this kind of pigmentation. It's, it's very, very difficult to predict who is going to pigment, who is not going to pigment. Maybe after we started a QPTP mode of Q-switch, it is started resolving. When, when it comes to probably uh, desired dermatology of la laser hair removal, here you see the pigmentation because of LHR. Probably, uh, we did a combination peel with good results. This is probably one of the best peel for pigmentation. Its contents probably have displayed it there. It is mostly inevitable in Indian patients and Asian patients. We are known for pH. It's very important because in colored skin, you have a number of ways to take to 
pigmentation. That is a very important aspect uh, in the lasers. Uh, where you are going to treat type 4, 5, 6 and types, you should need a uh, laser which doesn't produce much of PS, so Q India gas is once, so it has very short pulse duration less than 20 nanoseconds. And basic mechanism is photothermal is of 15 days one of So minimal damage to the epidermis. So we are not having any uh, then only we can target these melanosomes. And long run of 106 foot can target all the dermal lesions and blue black factors. And 532 nanometers only used to treat the uh, rectal factors and epidermal pigments. Uh, these are other facts, I am not going into details. Actually, destroyed in the manophores in the zebra of fish and human capnocytes, LBM glass. Uh, so, LBM yard is 2940, so LBM glass is 1550 nanometer. So, this is a single session of the LBM yard laser field. 8 ohm spot size it is a very safe zone. 8 ohm or 10 ohm spot size and 1064 nanometer. We can start from 1 zone, so you can go up to 1.6 zones and higher frequency, 10 hertz, 5 hertz, 2 hertz. Uh, Periodical areas you have to reduce the frequency. But 8 ohm 